Welcome everybody to today's uh, conversation between Professor John Clark and Mr. TK Sabapati. It gives me great pleasure to welcome them to this event. So a few years ago, uh, John approached the gallery with a really rather large manuscript entitled The Asian Modern. It comprised two uh, extensive volumes that looked at the phenomena of the modern in Asian art from about the 1850s to the present day, uh, using detailed case studies of individual artists and their lives, and in this way generated a new paradigm for, for this art history, uh, drawing from John's own meticulous research that he's done over the years. The outlook of this publication is broadly in line with the gallery's own view, which is to reframe and rewrite the history of modern Southeast Asian art to take into account new and multiple perspectives and using an explicitly comparative approach. And this view informs our very research, publications and exhibitions. The gallery is also expanding its list of research-based publications to include more titles by scholars in this field. And so the Asian modern fit in very nicely with our direction. And to me, it was clear that we should publish it. After many months of hard work, uh, which included the kind contribution of uh, Julie Ewington, who edited the manuscript so sensitively and accurately, we really can't think of anyone who would have been better suited for that job. We have published the book. Now, John and TK are both very well known amongst us and uh, need little introduction. TK has spent over 40 years contributing to visual art through research, scholarship, curation, and education in Singapore at the National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological Institution, and the National Institute of Education. And John is Emeritus Professor in Art History at the University of Sydney and has written and edited a number of very highly regarded publications. Now, these gentlemen have met many, many times. We've seen them speak with each other before, and I dare say that amazing things can happen when two such experienced, erudite, and well-acquainted associates and friends come together. We've witnessed very inspired conversations filled with compelling thoughts, sparkling wit, and nothing short of sparks flying. We only have about 45 minutes today, so I don't want to take up any more of this precious time. Over to you, gentlemen. Hello, John. Can we hear him? No. All right. And I thought you can, Aga. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're getting there. You're getting there. I'm getting there. Um, we meet with John Clark to hear from him on the writing of the Asian Modern, published by the National Gallery Singapore. What writers say on writing a book is of immense interest. To hear how it has been put together thoughts on securing resources and for creatively, critically interpreting them, thoughts on sustaining motivation for writing and methods of work over time, on collaboration, on difficulties with oneself and differences with others and so on. Especially when writing producing a publication with an encompassing scope such as the Asian modern, consisting of multiple locations, complicated interconnections, numerous players, and contending representational demands. We wish to hear the writer on some of these matters, even as in this instance, 
John Clark sets them out in the publication patiently and painstakingly. Besides, rarely do we hear a historian of art talk about the writing of an art history text in its particularities, which is what we hope to do at this occasion. I report on the publication briefly and do so with some difficulty and then uh, prompt John into talking about it. It emerges from a lifelong study, writing, teaching, and curating. Saying this is not to announce a conclusion, not to herald a summation of John's formative role in defining, constructing, advocating the Asian modern as a distinctive, integral, and significant field in art history. It is to point to complex terrain and sustain duration of scholarship from which it materializes. A terrain cultivated methodically from the 1970s. It is to recognize a study that distills knowledge advanced over 40 years of reviewing, redirecting, in the first instance, his scholarship, as well as that of, in the second instance, others who constitute this field earlier and presently, redirecting them towards new art historical purposes. On this matter, John readily says, critical art histories are, and I quote him, truly collaborative creations, and I would not have written them without such friends and peers, end of quote. He names and cites an extensive range of individuals and institutions, as he does when publishing Modern Asian Art in 1998, which is his first, in which he proposes an overview of the modern in a number of Asian countries. Even so, for one writer to cover such a field, a field encompassing artists, art, art discourses and institutions in Japan, China, Korea, India, and locations in Southeast Asia, each of which is conventionally mapped as a distinct separate field in itself. For one to cover all of them interrelatedly is formidable and virtually unmatched. And it has been cultivated strenuously. I say some things on the uh, composition, if I may say so, of the Asian modern. It consists of two parts issued as a single publication. Each is introduced by Patrick Flores, who probingly draws attention to the scope of the text, how and what has been written, and their implications for writing on art in locations in Asia and for reading texts on art. John provides for each part carefully structured, intricately woven frames for describing, analyzing, and historically appraising artists, their lives, practices, and work, their institutional status or non status across multiple locations in from Asia and from Australia, which is somewhat surprising in this, in this sense. Appraising them as talking with each other, thereby yielding comparative scrutiny and relatedness. The Asian modern spans 150 years from the 1850s to the present. 
the century and a half is periodized into distinct yet related sectors. A chapter is devoted to each period and to topics or problematics related to a period. Each chapter is written around, on, with artists. There are 25 who are designated as, in John's terms, marker artists, whose lives, practices, and works are installed as, as salient, while many, many others are featured in varying affiliated positions and relationships. Section one covers about a hundred years from 1850 until about the Second World War, while second, section two deals with the 1940s, beginning with abstraction and conceptualism until the end of the 20th century and with the contemporary. The entire opus is furnished with a summary, with a conclusion, in which foundational premises distinguishing, hallmarking John Clark's scholarship are re-articulated, forwarded with heightened criticality. A prognosis of things yet to be done is inserted. On this note, on on the note of things yet to be done, John remarks, and I quote, Radin Saleh and Simon Flores y de la Rosa present moments of modernity not hitherto been awarded the status of modern works within a pan-Asian or international canon, end of quote. While we may read the Asian modern as constructively inaugura inaugurating, validating such a claim, John Clark ends somewhat circumspectly, and I read, we need, he says, many stud studies from Asian perspectives that can supply knowledge for bringing different Asian cultures into common comparative analysis. Perhaps this book, is a contribution to this beginning, end of quote. Readers wishing to re-familiarize themselves with Clark's convictions, scholarly principles, drives and methods for critically representing Asian modern art and artists will be invigorated when reading this final chapter. His resolve to forge perspectives for encompassing Asia, notwithstanding powerful pulls, powerful demands of the nation and the national. His repeated assertions that Asian modern is hopelessly impeded when it is cast in the shadow of modernist paradigms of Euro-America are prominently restated and vigorously countered in this chapter. Indeed, he addresses these two constituencies directly. That is to say, the book begins by saying, and how what is written are aimed in the first instance at writers and readers of the modern in and of America who do not know, and those in Asia in the second who know the national, but not of cross-border connections. And it ends with a similar address, address to the two constituencies. John, I now turn to you, but uh, the first matter that I wish to ask you to talk about, I'd like to introduce it in this way. The principal chapters in the two volumes are written around and with artists. They mark dominant heartbeats in your telling of the Asian modern. You say this study offers, and I quote, fully cross-Asian analysis of plural modernities by bringing modern artists and their artworks into direct comparison. 
artists located in different cultures and discourses, but in relatively comparable in time. End of quote. Each is portrayed in astounding detail and vivacity. Each is enlivened by other artists who are brought into the marker artists' orbits. John, the question is, why artists? I ask not because their appearance in such prominence is unprecedented in your writing, not at all. Your research, your fieldwork entails meeting, talking with artists, visiting their studios, and is intensely connected to practices. I ask because prevailing tendencies lean towards focusing on the artwork, to considering its reception, to secure for its social, political, and cultural significance, and in doing so, the artist fades into the background. Why artists? Shall I go? Yes, I finished, John. <laughs> finished? Okay. Oh, was it Richard Wolheim said in Art Alone and Its Objects? Art is what artists do. And um, we've been taken on a long trip away from art objects, partly by the legitimate, I think, and fruitful critique of art objects as they occurred in sanctifying or um, codifying institutions such as museums or collections, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, we're taken away from the people, the producers, and put in the place of things which can be discussed almost without reference to the people who made them. One of the problems of art history is that it really wants to know what happened between artists' objects and their institutions. And it has to choose a focus on one of the three or one of the four. The institution itself can be a focus. Um, but we moved in the direction of not paying any attention to the makers. And the makers are very interesting because the makers have a, they're implicated in their history. We don't have to talk about colonialism in the case of Radin Salah, who knows it very, very well, as do a large number of other artists really up until after the Second World War in various ways. Um, we have to talk about how they encountered colonialism or what they did with it. So One of our problems in art history is the intellectual legitimacy of the discipline to some extent has been, uh, um, I wouldn't say stolen, but anyway, taken away by huge emphasis on either philosophic discourse or sociological discourse, one or the other. These are where we've, an anthropology of course, where we've taken concepts about what happens between objects and people, or what happens between things and the way they're consumed and circulated. Whereas we haven't really thought that the people who are actually doing the making understand this quite well. And the other reason of looking at artists is, in a way, it helps you to get out of the problem of doing comparative art history with thousands and thousands of artists and enormous cultural continuities, which are all at the same time, which are constructed in the human mind, and you'd have to say ideologically, because of the rise of the modern state in intellectual discourse as them and us. And the us is generally speaking, our group inside another group, and them is them as a dominating force. And you see this in different ways with a totally false notion of East and West, which is still used by Chinese artists, by the way. I don't know about all the artists in Southeast Asia. I think Southeast Asia is in some ways blessed because it's too complicated to work in terms of East and West, and that almost always has. And there are plenty of local controverting forces, such as the Peranakan in Malaysia or um, various currents in Islam, for example, are not in any way binary. Binarism is a real enemy because it's so easy for thought. 
And it's very easy to say, well, there's only one thing and it's ours, not yours. There's the binary straight away, which some of our greater thinkers actually still indulge in. And you think, excuse me, are we only one thing? Or is the one thingness simply a product of one culture somewhere else in a dominant position? So this is a, the way, a reason, the reason you focus on artists, is you can, without being biographical, without thinking this is a social creation of their social and personal situation, you can actually take account of the modern state and the modern exhibiting institution, the modern training institution, the modern ideological structures, insofar as it affects that particular artist. It also stops you producing silly binaries. East and West is obviously one, Japan and the West is another, China and the West. I mean, it goes on and on and on, you know. We don't need it anymore. And another one, of course, of which you somewhat indelicately hinted at the beginning is Australia and Asia. Excuse me, the population of Sydney is now one-third Asian. The population of northern Australia in the 1850s in the gold rush was 50% Chinese, or there yeah, give and take, depends where you look. So the, Australia has been very strongly linked to Asia and part of Asia for a very long time. It's just our political class keeps forgetting that and rediscovering it. As one colleague, um, an eminent historian of Indonesian art said, every 30 years they rediscover their part of Asia. Well, those sort of cycles of discovery and rediscovery may have taken place in Australia, but they haven't taken place among the Asian countries I've looked at. So the reason we three Australian artists in is, one, to show how long the relationship with Asia is, two, how controversial it might be, um, three, how, and in fact, it makes a different notion of Asia. I mean, you could do it from Vladivostok if you wanted to. Russian Far East. It's full of artists, art school, and to some extent isolated from the currents in Moscow and the former Leningrad. So, you know, they're part of the world as well. So the notion of Asia isn't quite as simple as people of a certain ethnic background or a particular geographical location. It's a much more distributed discourse. And the more we can think about distributed discourses in Asia, the better it will be for all of us. Because we'll, we'll stop reinforcing the wonderful ide ideological trope, which is that we are superior or not superior. Of course, that may also enable us to look at the horrors of the past, which need looking at all the world, everywhere, not only in the 19th century, but in the 1940s. And of course, the Australian horrors committed on it. Indigenous population only stopped in the 1920s, but the residue is still with us in the number of children incarcerated in prisons and so forth. So, I mean, you know, there are lots of things which can go on if you stop thinking sing in singular terms and, um, and, and very conveniently binary terms. Uh, I've gone off the art, haven't I? Okay, sorry. There is a political edge to what I'm saying, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you have touched on many things which we will come to more specifically a little later on, especially the 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 entry of Australia Australia into this particular account. Um, let let me just stay a little bit more with the with the with the uh, presentation of the artists. Um, yeah. Artists are here in this instance written to as bearing arts history and bearing it newly. I think the, the, one of the declared aims here or ambitions that you set out is via the uh, analysis and, uh, and investigation into artists, their practices, not isolatedly, but in their social milieu, in their political milieu, in their aesthetic milieu, and in relation to others, would be a way of circumventing some of the obstacles that are present or that, that are sort of elided in the writing of, of uh, a lot, uh, sort of analytical art histories in Asia. 
I think this is something that this is this is an, a, and this is a a conviction that 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 runs right through the the entire publication and your investigation of the individual artists, uh, where you also ask that it say that it is important to close stay close to to practitioners, while at the same time you exercise a more distance and reserved approach regarding, and this is interesting, politics as the noise outside the studio rather than the only vibration which shudders right through it. This must come as quite a astounding counter to what you described a little earlier, the, the emphasis on sociological, political, uh, 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 cultural um, lenses through which the art object is, is presented and talked about. Yeah, it's a kind of metaphor, obviously, for um, not ignor ignoring politics, but giving it a more appropriate place for the life of the artist and the expression of the artist. And you can see that in very many of the artists I've discovered. So um, the other reason for using artists is, in a way, um, perhaps in an illusory way or perhaps in a tendentious way, but anyway, it says the individual figures can create whatever context they're placed in, whatever kind of pressures they're subject to. It's a kind of, I hope Pastor Knight will forgive me, but it's a kind of Chivago-esque kind of position about art creation. Um, the, the notion that, you know, they have it in their hands to do what they can do with what they've got, rather than being the print out of a computer program or the forced projection of some set of political and economic forces. They work with that. They can't escape it. You know, both uh, um, Sally and um, um, other artists have, you know, had to exhibit inside European uh, salon for, uh, situation. It doesn't stop them doing it. They're doing something with it, you know, uh, whether it might be very difficult to see, whether you might think they're completely controlled. Although, my, as you know, with, with Rod and Sally, we owe a very great deal to our, our colleague in Germany, Werner Kaus, who's shown us that what seems to be a 19th century, in quotes, unquote, Orientalist picture with a tiger and, and, a, and a couple wandering past is in fact an elaborate allegory about the domination of, uh, of the Indonesian um, colonies by the Dutch. Uh, they, so they're, 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 you know, people work within these kinds of forces without necessarily proclaiming them out in the front. Mm. Um, yeah. the, other, um, the, other, the other thing I, I must say on this juncture, which is quite, I think is of some importance, is I get fed up as no doubt you do, and many other of my colleagues who know about various art cultures, is seeing the same names presented in the same museum context in Europe and America, as if these are a grand discovery by the art historian or the curator or whoever did it, when they've been known about for junks for, for a long, long time in their own cultures. I'm given proper, given a proper kind of status in some cases, not always, but sometimes. You know, these are not just these artists. Generally speaking, are not they're out of knowledge. They're in knowledge. It's just knowledge which is not part of, if you like, generalized art history. Sorry. Hmm. Yeah. In in the construction of the portraits of each artist, and I use that term advisedly, but. Uh, but I think uh, quite usefully, the gathering of immense range of resources, selecting, composing a life. Are there schemes or sketches for the making of each of these artists? I'm not. I'm not suggesting that they all neatly fit into a formula and and come out in a conveyor belt because there are immense variations. And in this, somewhat uh, somebody like. Gulam Muhammad Sheikh comes out 
as I think among all the artists whom we write on as the most complexly written artist in the in, in the entire in the entire well, corpus. But but well, he's but, also he's also sorry. No, I, I'm just asking in in uh, wishing to hear from you the 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 constructive principles about which you which you employ in in developing the life and times and the work of an, of an artist and in relation to others as well um, is there is there such a scheme that is at work for all the 25 in each instance not really um, but gulam is a very uh, useful marker artist in the sense that um, he's so exposed to um, Indian art itself, to Indian poetics in the Gujarati language, which he himself writes as a poet. And his own history, if you look at it carefully, moves from um, a quasi-colonial situation to an uh, independent Indian situation. Mm. Um, and then, um, how can I put it, works with stylistic possibilities, which are between cultures, not in one culture as such. Um, so this is frequently done by modern artists in Asia. They work between visual discourses rather than in one discourse. Of course, they may, in a way, establish a visual discourse by doing so, but um, uh, we have no doubt that this is an Indian artist, but we have no doubt also this is an extremely um, multi-oriented artist. And maybe the, well, that's my only defect as, a, as an art historian. I tend to choose artists who are not um, if you like, focused on one culture or focused in one direction. I don't. I, t I tend to like artists who move in many different directions. Could we have the next slide from the Philippines, please? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Roberto Faleo is an, an obvious case of an artist, instead of going forward, decided to go back to try and find a pre-colonial, let alone a pre-Hispanic, mythology or elements of mythology, which you could then work into, in his case, um, installation art, but also into important sculpture. And before that, uh, drawing books, uh, which are with drawings of mythological figures which appeared in books. Um, you'd think that this was some kind of revanchist or reactionary rediscovery of the Philippine past. But in fact, Roberto himself is a son, of, is a grandson of the founder of the Philippines Communist Party. His father was killed by one of the military regimes, and he himself, you know, uh, has had difficulties in that, in that nature. So this is a very political artist, but he's not showing it politically in his work. Why should he? Why should he have to? He should show what his work means about, if you like, his mythological or... Um, historical situation and um, sum that very well in, in this particular piece. But well, we can go back even to the very first image illustration of Radin Sala. You might want to talk about that a bit. I mean this is what's Radin Sala doing with this picture? You know, it's Biedermeyer kind of decorative mastery of the bourgeois family and so forth. Actually it's a tribute, very Orientalist tribute to his um, colonial civil servant patron, who's the guy standing up at the back. Yes. And also it's a kind of in memoriam to, I can't, I can't remember which of the children died, but one of the children died in this picture. I think it's the one on the left with the lady in the silk, what, a grey silk, oh, I might be wrong. Um, it's, it, you know, so he's just showing the continuity of the family life, but also recognizing them all in this kind of matrix of forces which are all encompassed in, including him. Um, a very fascinating, you could think about this picture for a very long time, there's a lot going on in it. And then there's this sort of landscape on the wall, one of, he didn't do very many landscapes, but he did a landscape like, or kind of cognate with that. 
um, roughly speaking, at the same time. So uh, there's a, there's a lot. It's a bit like you know the bourgeois family in Victorian art. You know, it, it's telling you a lot more about the people there than you actually think. And the artist is a lot more knowing about those things than you actually believe. He's made a point of clarifying, but there you are. It's going on. It's there. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you want to say anything about this picture. It's kind of, it's a, there, are, there are several, if you like, marker pictures by Rad and Saleh. Um, this is one of them. Another was exhibited in the French, we haven't got a picture of it up here today, it's in the book, a picture which is exhibited in the French Salon, which is bought by the French state. And in the preparation in which he was visited in his studio by a Malay scholar, or at least if we believe the text, I mean, there's a problem about the nature of the text, but which is, of course, comes from my French colleagues. But this, this scholar of Malay brought with him a poet, Baudelaire. This were kind of, you know, I mean, this is the whole problem with the bloody ignorance of the northern institutions. They don't even recognize when their own artists of some significance have been in touch with these artists from Asia. They don't recognize, they don't know who they are. And they might after the Second World War, when records are clearer, and they might even in France in the 1920s and 30s. But that's it. Before that, no. Um, so, um, and it you know, just seems like something, 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 you know, um, picture with, which it is, of course, that's true, but it's also doing something else. What it's doing, I don't know. I don't know entirely, but I guess, you know, it's a sort of sympathy for this family. And Radha and Sally left a, a, a personal memoir, but a bit of it which survived the Second World War says that, you know, I've got two selves. One is, a, you know, an Indonesian and one is a Prussian family. There are pictures to that which indicate that. I learned the book, I think. So, um, no, no, even at the very inception of, of, of modern art in, in Asia, there's a kind of bifurcated self, but it's not bifurcated in the east west side. It's me having my different kinds of experiences in different contexts, of which this is one I'm joining you now. And uh, that's, that's uh, but of course, that inside had a very difficult time when he went back to uh, the Dutch Indies as it was then. Um, because he was kind of ostracized and he was subject to all kinds of racist abuse and stuff like that uh, because he was Indonesian, even though he's a minor aristocrat. He wasn't a prince, but he's a minor aristocrat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Staying, staying with the writing of the artist, I want to draw attention to the, the language that you have developed and employed in the, in the writing of these of these individual portraits and uh, there's a whole variety of registers on which the language unfolds uh, some of it is even novelistic in tone and temper some uh, some of it veers towards the descriptive some others towards the analytical and uh, the opening lines with which, with which an artist walks onto the stage, your stage, I think is indicative of all that is to come, all that that is said and written subsequently. Here are two that I have picked up, which strike me as being uh, pertinent to, to the manner in which the artist is forwarded. Yes, Radin Sally. You say, and these are the very first lines with which Radin is brought in. Radin Saleh spends so much of his artistic life overseas that he represents a type of early internationalist, much more yeah. than crew in Kong or Simon Flores, located as they were so clearly in the endogenous or local, whatever their different external co contexts. Here are three artists brought together. Uh, 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 Crew in Kong precedes the account of Radin Saleh, and Simon Flores precedes the, 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 the presentation of Radin Saleh. In that single one line, all three are bracketed. While they are bracketed, each is 
nevertheless installed as being sufficiently distinctive and there are important hints as to how they might subsequently be connected. And the first lines for Simon Flores, for, uh, I mean, is, is, is sort of synchronizes with what you have just written on Rajan Saleh. And here it is. Rajan Saleh spent so much of his artistic life overseas. The first line in Simon Flores says, Simon Flores did not travel abroad. And yet, and yet, his art was wholly endogenously nested. What a, what a wonderful word, nested exogenous component. To understand this, we must think of the longevity and particular structures of Spanish colonial art in the Philippines and so on. I, I have in, in my notes about 10 pages filled with extracts of the op opening lines. And if you stretch them out across a banner, they, they dramatically reveal the encapsulation of the artist in just that opening moment and all that is to come. You know, you there's can, a problem with it. Sorry, there's just a one last remark. Sorry, yeah. You, 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 you acknowledge Julie Ewington uh, 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 profusely and, 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 and deeply appreciatively in, 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 in sort of assisting in cultivating the the, in editing the entire script. But I think it appears to be more than editing. There's a kind of collab, I sense a collaboration between the two of you in, uh, in the actual stylistics, if you like, the tempo and temperament of the writing. Right, John? Say, say some things on these matters. All right. Uh, uh, we're going to take the last point first. Judy is a remarkable person. She actually organised the first art exhibition of women's art in Australia. And this has been eclipsed by subsequent exhibitions which have occupied more attention in the museum world. But in fact, she's very important in that area. And she's actually a very considerable writer in her own. Uh, yes, in her own. Yes. Sure. So she's a bit more than just an editor. You're quite correct. But she's also a bit like... Um, um, a friendly enemy, you know. She's somebody you've got to you've got to con con convince. You have a number of those. You have a number of those, John. Well, I said, but she's a friendly enemy, not, not, not an enemy enemy. She's really, really good, you know, putting you on the spot. She told me I left a note about the Aboriginal massacres, which wasn't adequate, and some colleague comrades would object to it, so I changed it. You know, that kind of thing is very useful. Um, but going back to uh, Flores and the complexity of Flores, um, I didn't hadn't been to the Philippines when I wrote Modern Asian Art. I subsequently went there because I, I realised I was going to fill this if you like lacuna in my own knowledge. So I, that's why you've got um, not only Luna but also Edades and uh, Pulutao Fileo. And there's another one somewhere, isn't there? Um, oh yeah, anyway, that'll do for the moment. Um, I try not to go beyond three artists for each country. Um, the reason why Flores is so interesting is because it makes you think about something you can't see. One thing reason you can't see the greatness of, Indi of uh, Spanish style Philippine art is a lot of it was destroyed in the Second World War. If you go, if you're fortunate enough to be invited to go or given the guided tour to the Intramuros Museum in Manila, you see one fantastic piece of religious sculpture after another. I just, you know, really, really find, and there's a bit, the bits of it in um, um, the University of Santo Tomas has a museum, and then you see it here and there, you know. So this is a culture with where somehow this worship of icons matched a particular indigenous strain called Anitos, uh, cult, 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 cult of an ancestor figures. But they, I mean, there's so much really <laughs> fantastically good and then moving in, in some cases. I'm not a particularly a Christian, I'm certainly not a Catholic. But, um, 
you know, you, you keep thinking, oh, this is just wonderful. Why, why, why haven't I heard this? Well, first of all, a lot of it was destroyed, and secondly, it doesn't circulate outside the Philippines. Well, why is that? I don't know. It's probably the re responsibility of the Philippine elite keeping it to themselves. It may be that there aren't enough people outside the Philippines who've seen it to know that's important and interesting. So um, the problem is that Philippine art was largely produced by Chinese craftsmen in the 19th, in the 18th century. It goes back a long way. You can actually trace it, you know, by this textual reference or who got training as a draftsman and the fact that Chinese craftsmen could form um, guilds or uh, working um, studios if they converted to Catholicism. And there's a whole area of Madrid where these people live. Um, and uh, maybe you know we don't we don't know about it because people aren't interested in Catholic devotional sculpture of the early nineteenth century. I don't know, but I mean, just well, on my travels, as it were, there are two places where my eyes always jump with modern art, not nineteenth century Spanish art. One was the Philippines, and the other is Korea. I mean, you just look at anything. This is astonishing. This is so good. I mean, whatever you, whatever it is, it's just just so powerful um, and aesthetically accomplished, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, I don't know that the Philippines serves its artists as well as it should, but that's a reflection of the way art is collected and the interface between the oligarchic collectors and public institutions. And I can't really do anything about that, but I've noticed. Um, and, Philip, and Korea, of course, has now become much more obvious with mm. cinema, but a long time ago it was obvious with, with music because Korean music is just astonishingly good and the produ culture produces such astonishingly high level and in it completely integrated, um, quotes, classical, unquote, musician. Um, and then avant-gardist as well, even in the 50s. You know, there's that famous photograph of Dungeon Fight with um, the composer, yeah, what's his name? Uh, he sang, is it the uh, composer, the, the Korean modernist composer, and John Page, John Cage, all in the same photograph, the dumpster. Yeah, you, know, you think, oh, <laughs> Um, I mean, okay. that's, that's something I would like people to pay more attention to because we're not talking about now. That's the problem with contemporary art. It talks about now. It doesn't understand that now is based on a huge modern and contemporary stratum of linkages and re-articulations and so on and so forth, um, which is in, the, in, in, in terms of the yeah, our discourse is in that country. And I mean, it's which, just which, in, 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 yeah. internal to the internal, it's, it's endogenous art, art, modern art, in other words. In Korea, for example, I mean, it might be set off a little bit or stimulated by surrealist poetry in the 40s and, you know, modernist novels written in Tokyo in the 40s, but it's still Korean. Yeah. Which, and of course, which, it's smashed it. Which is at the core of your thinking on the contemporary as well. Sorry to interrupt, John, but can I yes, can we ahead. move on? Can, yeah, can we course. move on to um, what could be considered as the, uh, the the kind of spine in your in your comparative study, and that is to do with advocating a modern that is Asian in scope, reach, and as a field. You yeah. vigorously deal with connections stemming from comparisons, even when yeah. material and links are absent. Whereby, yeah. as you say, artists are located in different cultures and discourses are brought into comparable situations or prospects. This is somewhat yeah. startling because one conventionally is taught that in any kind of a historical scheme, one has to look for assiduously and carefully at causal connections or connections that are put forward causally with 
material and documentary evidence in order to consolidate these. You, I'm, yeah. I'm not suggesting that you are suggesting a, you are pr uh, proposing a freewheeling, uh, 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 sort of un unthinking and anarchic approach to making these comparisons. Uh, but you nevertheless maintain that these comparisons can be speculatively and hypothetically uh, developed and structured and advanced in order to bring about linkages between persons who ostensibly are not connected. Yeah, um, I, I think um, you see the same in some kinds of European art history about the Middle Ages in its relationship to the Renaissance, for example. This is not entirely unusual. It's just one of the problems with art history in Europe say Europe particularly, is it suffers from the illusion of continuity rather than fast and slow, deep and, and superficial, um, well articulated and poorly articulated and communicated and so forth. Um, it, it, there is a kind of a substantivism, you may call it that, which is part of European art historical discourse. You can't say that because there isn't anything there. And you say, yeah, but they look like each other and they're similar. And the, the problem with um, modern Asian art in general is it suffers from a kind of reverse teleology, the teleology of modernism, which is always looking for the new, which is always inventing new positions, which is always trying to be something other than what it was in the past, um, even if that's the rediscovery of the present and all that sort of stuff. That's a very European, or more generally speaking, Euro-American point of view. Um, maybe some Asian cultures, or the relationship between the traditional and the modern, well, I'll come back to that, in Asian, some Asian contexts, and I think repeatedly across several Asian contexts, is far less mechanical, far less directly linked in a sort of solution to a problem kind of mentality, which we see in, uh, basically speaking, a European modernism up to conceptualism at any rate, if not including contemporary. Um, and of course, the problem with the contemporary is contemporary, so we can't see it historically because we're still part of it. It's the first problem. And the second problem is, of course, well, it may not be contemporary. It may be just a revision or a reworking or a retro event in a discourse which is unfolding in a way which we can't really understand. But whatever the technological and um, you like physical expressiveness of the medium that's been deployed may be. Um, what uh, Asian societies in general, I might say just in general, as an abstract principle at any rate, present us with is the problem that the tradition is not separated from the modern. It's the reverse or the other side of the modern. They're linked together. They're like, um, what's that French anthropology called? Um, um, worked on Algeria. Um, habitus, uh, the front and the back of something. They're linked together. You can't see them linked properly, but they are actually one whole. And um, this is partly difficult to see in Europe because of the relationship, first of all, to teleology, but secondly, to um, the notion that the tradition is eluded, evasculated, removed, destroyed by the modern, which invents a new solution. Well, I don't think that could be true. And there's some recent thinkers about what modern sciences has also pointed that out, you know, that, that, that um, you carry the past with you and you carry the form, which is actually part of what you're doing now. It's just maybe not acknowledged or accepted as that. Sorry, that went a long day away, away from what you were asking. We have circled back to that. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we, we make sense of some of it. This is a comment on my part and uh, you are, at liberty to say something or not, as the case may be. 
But I want to say something on the the manner and the way the the exposure that you give to end notes in your text. Um, they are extremely expansive, generous, and extensive. Um, rarely does one get end notes written in the manner in which they are written here. Usually one squirrels away in them acknowledgments of uh, 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 text in which one has cited them or some kind of cursory comments on the usefulness or not so usefulness of these texts. But in yours, I, I, it almost appears like a parallel text to your main, your main writing or the writing in the main text. In terms, it appears to read like an exegesis, deep, concerned, respectful, and, and, and attentive analysis of text that you are reading. In terms, it appears as a documentary presentation of what is available in various archives. At other times, there are discussive and anecdotal uh, 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 relationships that you establish. And, and, and all of these, when they are brought together, they assume a coherence and a narrative verb which one rarely associates and expects in endnotes. And uh, although I did say that you, you need not comment, my, my, my curiosity is aroused whether this, this was a way of using the, the columns and the pagination for endnotes as expanding on your text, but differently, qualitatively and quantitatively. In, in addition to calling attention to the necessity to look at archives rigorously and attentively. Yeah, I mean, you're quite right in the last comment, um, but um, um, you've got to realize that as I started doing this work, I started finding lots of material which I thought should be draw to, drawn to the attention of the uh, necessarily English speaking reader. Or well, that doesn't mean to say the person who reads English is a native reader of English, that just the language is actually the medium for communicating the knowledge, which they would find very difficult to get hold of if they weren't seriously interested in following up that artist for that particular period. So I thought, oh, I'll, oh. instead of turning my text into a kind of replication of this knowledge, which indeed many art historical books are, by the way, there's a certain resistance to a certain kind of art historical writing there, you'd be correct to say. Um, I thought, well, why don't I put this material in a form which other people can use later when I'm not here. And um, that's why I created um, two registers of material for each volume, as it turned out now, one volume. Um, so you can actually go and look up what Ron Sale did in 1835 or whatever it was, if it's known, you know. Because I know that that knowledge is only in the German book, which I have access to. Or and sometimes we, one, one's quite well aware teaching in um, a modern Anglo university, let's put it like that, the uh, linguistic facility is not one of the skills that these people are provided with or need to find for themselves. So I thought, well, okay, I'll put this stuff down so that people can find it for themselves. Uh, and, of course, there's a slight definite, and you kind of be polite in noticing, critical edge to this. It says, look, you can't talk about these issues until you've looked at the following issues, the following matters, taking account of the following information. It's, it is a certain critical relationship to existing art history or previous catalogues in this area, which are unbearably trivial in their generalizations. 
Um, you, think, you know, if you'd read this, would you be able to say that? No, you wouldn't, or you would, but excuse me, I'll just turn that off. Yeah, so um, that's the that's the, um, the the import of those long footnotes, but also because um, that's perhaps being a little bit um, naive. It's also because the material I was looking at is very, very complicated. It's located between multiple cultures and often multiple linguistic uh, locations in a, in, a, in, a, in a history which hasn't really been adum adumbrated. I mean, is there a proper history of the Javanese court in the 1860s? No, there isn't. There are books, there are a few records, some of them have been translated. I've looked at a few things, but there's no proper analysis of what was happening to the cultural world of the Javanese aristocrats. As far as I know, I haven't seen it, I might be ignorant, and uh, um, that's true. I mean, there are bits and pieces, you know, education systems, budget systems, colonial laws and so forth, that's there in the history book. Whereas perhaps, perhaps I'm looking at this in a humanistic, old-fashioned humanistic, sort of Eurocentric humanism kind of way. I want to know what the worldview is of these people, and how it developed, and why it developed, and where it was located, and how it's articulated in this very, very complicated space. Well, if it's complicated, sometimes the only way you can acknowledge that complexity is by a footnote. That's why they're there. It may, yeah, it, it may be old-fashioned humanism, but humanistic. But I think it's extremely important and, and valuable what you have put forward. Um, I was going to ask a little con uh, for some discussion on Australia, India, but you have already delivered a mighty salvo a little early, earlier on. And uh, so I don't want to return to that, but I will still want to deal with Australia. And if I may, Turn the spotlights on you, John Clark, writing, teaching, curating, talking about the Asian modern in Australia as well as outside of Australia. And leading up to the question, uh, uh, I had the following to relate. And so bear with me while I read it out because I think it is important. Um, on completing your study work visit to Japan, and residence in Kyoto, you returned with your then partner wife to the United Kingdom in late 1976. And you described your journey in the following terms. A long arc home through Hong Kong, where we arrived the day after Mao Zedong's death, Thailand, which we left three days before the bloody October the 6th coup, Malaysia, Singapore, and three months in India, where Indira Gandhi's emergency was in force, end of quote. John, you never travel uneventfully, do you? I mean, except for Malaysia and Singapore, it's, it seems to be untouched. Okay, let me go on. Uh, in, the UK, in the UK, you taught part-time in art colleges and translated Japanese texts into English for a living. Right, fast forward to the 80s. In 1989, you are appointed to teach Japanese art history in the Australian National University, Canberra, your first yeah. full-time job. Yeah. Three years later, you moved to Sydney and the University of Sydney. But in 1991, while at ANU, you convene an international conference on modernism and postmodernism in Asian art. Papers from that conference are published as Modernity in Asian Art in 1993. 1993, the very year of the inauguration of the Asia Pacific Triennial at the Queensland Art Gallery in Brisbane, and seven years after the inaugural and first Asia and Regions Arts Convention in Perth. I believe it was in 1987. When reading of your journey and place of your domestic, of your domicile now, John, 
I'm struck by parallels with some of the lives of the artists you portray and discuss. I recall Fujita Tsuguhara, who you say set out to return to Japan from Paris in 1924, not directly, but you say, through a long meandering trip on the way through Argentina and Mexico. And while reporting on that, you speculate on reasons and implications of such a long arc and signal possibilities for discerning lateral international connections and for seeing artists liberated from constraints of their domestic art worlds, read nation, national, and those of France itself, read Euro-America. End of quote. I read this as possibly describing yourself as touching on your foundational grounds and impetus for your work and your lifelong commitment to mapping the Asian modern as a field. Could I ask you to talk a little on your living in Australia from 1989, continuing to publish and talk of the Asian modern in Australia, from Australia outward, coming in to Australia, which in your introduction to the three Australian artists referred to as settler cultures, but settler cultures that were secured, safeguarded and perpetuated by colonizers from the United Kingdom. Yeah. That very United Kingdom, which you left in 1989 to assume and the umbilical cord connecting Australia to the United Kingdom is still there vis-a-vis -vis think of the continuing disagreements on Australia Day and so on and so forth. Yeah, what is it? Could could you say something? Some some things about being there and doing what you are doing. I know you have written on this on a number of occasions on Australian, on Asian art in Australia, on Asian art history in Australia. But in the spirit of what we are doing here and now. Could you take us through some of your your thoughts on this matter? Yeah, it's very uh, provocative. Um, <laughs> first thing to remember is, in all of this, um, is that the Midlands town where my father was a chemical engineer um, called Coventry, um, was a site for a number of, as it turned out, middle class refugees from Vietnam in um, the mid 60s when I was just going off to university, one of whom was my girlfriend, and my first girlfriend. And um, about that time, I started to be enamored of. Japanese painting, which I'd seen in a book, a uh, painting of Seshu. Um, but this is a person who'd been in Germany as a child from 13 for three or four months every year. And God bless him, my father dragged me around every bloody museum there was to see, including Moritz Hughes, including the girl with the pearl earring, which I saw when I was 13. So I hadn't really got this, there are our art, their people, our people kind of mind. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was typical, but I would suggest in this kind of discourse or in trying to understand this kind of personal history that we don't think so much about people who has been firmly inside one or other culture or one or other set of possibilities. Um, they move around and they're more flexible than we even acknowledge. Um, I, I, a typical anecdote which shows this is um, my wife now, um, I was tight, um, had a friend who was a, a French doctor. We were talking about 
um, farmers in Isan, the northeastern Thailand. And he, uh, who I later knew, um, had been to Saudi Arabia or somewhere in the Gulf as a kind of hospital doctor. He worked as a doctor there um, for a while. And as he was walking across the desert in the middle of Saudi Arabia or whatever, he heard these men singing a song, which was an Isan song, which he could sing. He sang it with them. They were, strict, they were shocked. So even for the non-privileged, non-educated classes, as it were, you have to go abroad to labor and do engineering or various kinds of menial or semi-menial occupations, even now there's a kind of cosmopolitanism at the base which we ignore at our peril. Of course, my cosmopolitanism was based on an engineer father who took me to Germany as a child around Europe, and I kept looking for that kind of cosmopolitan relationship to the world ever since. But um, it has its pleasures and it has its perils, of course, and both of which we can discuss at another juncture. But um, when I came to Australia, I came with that background. I didn't come as a POM. I came as an expert on Japanese his art history. Okay. But I didn't come as a POM. I came as that. Um, I couldn't be an expert on Flemish stained glass. I don't know. I don't know that in Australia. Or whatever. Or one of the uh, – Australia in the 1950s was full of very interesting expatriate emigre artists from Eastern Europe. You know, that's where they came from because of the history. Conditions which changed the Australian art world enormously from what had been isolated, Anglo centric, and stuff like art world before that, up until maybe 46 or 47. So when I came to Australia, I didn't come as a palm, although I have to keep explaining to Australians that very unfortunately I am fluent in five languages and my grandfather was Dutch and so on, and so our great grandfather was Dutch. And my Another great novel was Wells. In other words, what they categorized as a POM was indeed polyglot, multicultural idiot of some kind, but not what they thought. So I'm very, very reluctant to go along the line of saying people are or are not like this until I've ex actually found out who they are, because we don't do that. We, we put them in categories. We think of their sociological function. We think of a, the unfolding of Australian art to Asia, as it indeed was the case in the 1990s, a very definitely large interest. But that had already been there, been there since the 1950s. The leading Australian contemporary, contemporary composer, Peter Skalsor, had studied Gagaku in Japan, you know, in the early 50s. And there are all kinds of other things there, um, which is why I chose Mar Margaret Preston to talk about, who in many other ways looked like a you know, rather toffee nosed middle class lady of a certain kind of you know, financial freedom because her husband was a banker. But there's all this kind of openness which belies or goes beyond the categories of closure with, with which we would try and hold it or handle it. Um, I mean, you may not know, but um, Preston did a very famous picture of the two Japanese midget submarines which had gone up in the harbour to destroy, try and destroy the fleet. And they put them on the beach and, you know, the soldiers were properly buried and so forth. And she did a painting of it. And she was obviously saying, this is not, this, we are, you know, why are we doing this? Having been to Japan much, very uh, much earlier and also been interested in Japanese art when she was in Paris in, before the First World War. So, you know, there's a, there's a very strong kind of current, eddying of currents going on here, which belies the notion, even the notion of Australia. The problem is, and this is the problem, the current political classes in Australia and in Malaysia and Singapore and the rest of the place want to work with these binary categories, want to put people outside, not like us, somewhere over there, and so on and so forth, rather than looking at what they actually do with us. 
which is the art that they make in this case, or the very extensive influence on Australian contemporary literature. I despair of talking to Chinese friends about Australian literature. I said, you're ignorant. You know, this is one of the cultures in this part of the world with a huge and very, 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 very rich contemporary literature. Don't you read it? No, they don't because they don't read English. You know, and the people who read English don't propagandize these artists or they get nowhere with it. I mean, but the same is true of all cultures. They, they, they categorize art products. And I remember a distinct, very distinguished Japanese and um, admired person. We show these prejudices very, very clearly with uh, J.T. Ballard's book about um, Empire of the Sun. Uh, I said, oh, he's, he's just such a great writer. Uh, yeah, he just writes war books. And I said, no, he doesn't. Go away and read his surrealist novels about modern society. Aren't you interested in finding out? And this is Anglophone, quite interested in English literature and so forth. He didn't, you know, it hadn't. So we all create our little blockages. Um, sometimes they're all oriented towards the future and sometimes towards the past. Can we go, can we go to my very last slide, please? That's it, yeah. the leap one. There's such a grandeur about this piece, unbearably grand, huge scale, totally interesting yeah. relationship between the forms, materials, the way it's presented to the viewer who walks through the landscape. This is, you know, it's, and I'm, has it got the size there? I can't remember. Yes, it is. It's three meters by 35 by, by 18 meters. Absolutely enormous. This is modern Asia. This is a, a place where very, very many things can be shown, experienced, it's not a kind of twee little stone in the corner of a Zen garden. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being rude to friends of mine who make twee little stones in the corners of Zen gardens, but you know, basically, this is a different kind of place. And it's there. It's not invented for tomorrow, it's there now. And that's why I wanted to end with this picture, which um, unfortunately the publisher couldn't create a picture of the right. I wanted it to be a huge reproduction, but they couldn't do it. So. Fair enough. That happens with our books. Well, okay. I I appreciate the grandly elusive reply to that question, John, and uh, we'll ask it again John. on another occasion. I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and and, uh, but I think I think it's time to wrap up, wrap this up, and. Um, I wish to say the following. Um, Patrick Flores, when introducing volume one, describes John Clark's study and representation of the Asian modern over the years and its many avatars as manifesting, in his words, a magnificent obsession. And that what has been written is a magisterial opus. I think Patrick gets it right. The many who know John's work, his teaching, will testify to this unhesitatingly. If not all are in total agreement with him all of the time. This obsession is not held close within him, but available publicly and personally. This publication testifies to all of this. I wish to say the magnificence of that obsession is matched by what is written as the Asian modern and how it is written. John Clark, congratulations. I wish to extend deep appreciation as well to the teams in the editorial and public sectors of the National Gallery Singapore, especially Elaine E. and Charmaine Un, for producing a book of immense importance. John, thank you. Of course, we wish that 
you could have been here to launch it in the premises of the gallery in the presence of a live audience who would undoubtedly have provoked, generated multiple responses to what you have written and what you say about the book itself. But we will look forward to that on another occasion. Take care, John, and bye-bye to everyone who's been tuning in and watching it. Until the next time. Thank you, gentlemen, for that really very uh, engaging and insightful exchange. TK, you did such great justice to both John and his publication, uh, and drawing parallels between the lives of some of the artists in John's book and John's own life, I found particularly special. And John, thank you for the insight into the thinking and experiences and the impetus behind your research and this publication. You know, it's clear from everything that transpired that this publication is uh, not just valuable, but also necessary, I think, for advancing scholarship in this area of art history. So we have uh, almost run out of time, but before we go, John, we have a little surprise for you. Please uh -huh. enjoy this. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I first met John in 2001, starting my PhD at the University of Sydney. And after that, we became close friends, close colleagues. One of the things that John really did for me, had confidence in me, he encouraged me to do the PhD. And um, I'm forever grateful for that, John. Uh, you've been a great mentor and a great teacher. From him, I've also gained an appreciation for the labor and serendipity of patient archival research by being adventurous in following where the clues of our history might take us, the process has been consistent in rewarding me with an unalienated life in scholarship. Not only has your generosity meant a great deal to me personally, but it has also provided a model for me to interact with and support my students. You must know, John, that you have been and always be an inspiration for me in terms of my, you know, being an art historian as a career. I owe a lot to him and I want to use this opportunity to thank him from the bottom of my heart for being a pillar of support throughout my academic journey. Thank you for always taking time to read my draft. I'm sorry you had to wake up 5am to do it and thank you for always believing in me. From you, I've learned how to be a teacher to others. John, I want to thank you for being a tough and generous teacher and the one thing I learned from you was perseverance. Um, he can be brusque, as many of us know, yet to students he's been invariably um, generous, incredibly open with his work. Uh, his commitment to the field, I think, remains daunting and also inspiring. And back then, John, I have to say, was a pretty fearsome figure around the department. But for those of us who became his PhD students, we learned that John is a very kind-hearted person. He was extremely supportive of our research, extremely enthusiastic about what we could do, and also very generous. And uh, I had a wonderful experience of John's personal generosity a few years ago. I opened my mail only to find that John had sent me some 15 volumes of modern European poetry from his own collection, just because he thought I would be interested. Above all, John has taught me and many of us how to think about the worlds of Asian art systemically and systematically. So thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thank you for putting up with me. Uh, thanks again. So thank you and congratulations again. Thank you, John Sensei. Thank you, John. I wish you all the best with the book. Thank you again and I wish you strong and healthy always. Well done, John. Yes, congratulations. It's very touching to see the impact you've uh, made on a whole generation of scholars and curators. So before That's we right. go, just a reminder, <laughs> just a reminder that uh, the Asian Modern is, uh, can be ordered through the gallery's uh, website.
it's nationalgallery.sg and we're extending a 10% discount through 7th of March. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.